Well, hey guys, Kaylee Olson here with the Proverbs 31 Ministries podcast, where we share biblical truth for any girl in any season. And I'm here with my co-host, Meredith Brock. Well, hey everybody, I am excited you're here today to listen to this episode with our friend, Nikki Koziars, titled, Three Questions to Ask When Faith Feels Impossible. (laughs) I'm not sure why faith feels impossible for you today, friend, but I want you to know you are not alone. Absolutely. In this episode, Nikki really opens up about a difficult season in her life where her faith felt impossible. And through tears from all of us, I believe that was such a touching recording. Mm -hmm. We process God's goodness and how he invites us in to bring our raw questions to him in our hardest times. So take a listen. Well, friends, we are so excited to have our good friend, Nikki Koziars, joining us on the podcast today. Welcome, Nikki. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, Meredith. I love you guys. I'm so excited. We're in the new building. Yes, we are. Yeah. Starting Ministries. <laughs> this is my first time here. It's great. I love it. We're in an actual studio. We feel very grown up. I really do <laughs> feel super grown up. This is like a, a big step forward from like mm-hmm. draping blankets yes. over furniture yes. in a random we office. A little scrappy. Little scrappy. Hey, yes. nothing but wrong with being scrappy, being y'all. Scrappy <laughs> makes you appreciative <laughs> yes. for, for what you have yes, now. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. Well, y'all, Nikki is a longtime friend of the ministry, and you guys know her as an author of several books, but... Today, we are so excited to let you know that she is the author of a brand new book yes. that just released called Flooded, The Five Best Decisions to Make When Life is Hard and Doubt is Rising. And I don't know about you guys, but I have certainly been through some hard seasons, and mm-hmm. I have certainly had to do battle against doubt. And so, mm-hmm. Nikki, I have been with you in this process of— Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> of, uh writing the book, of just getting everything ready to release a book. I'd love for you to share with our listeners today, what's maybe something surprising that you've learned in this process or something the Lord is teaching you um, that might, I don't know, that would surprise our listeners? Yes. Well, first thing I would say is uh, it is very interesting to release a book during a worldwide pandemic. That would be (laughs) the first thing. Uh, There's been a lot of challenges that come with the release and getting this message out there. But the thing that I think has most surprised me about this message, and you know, Meredith, you know, and Kayla, you know, unfortunately, authors have to painfully live out their messages, it seems like, with Proverbs 31 (laughs) Ministries. Uh, And the thing that surprised me was I thought I had gone through the hardest uh, circumstances when I started to write the book. Um, And I'm going to share a little bit of that during my teaching today. But the hardest things actually came during during the writing Mm, of the book. So that kind of caught me a little bit off guard because I thought me and God were good. I thought (laughs) I thought I knew where we were heading, uh, and he. he allowed quite a few curveballs to come at my way to, mm-hmm. I think it was to keep me humble and to make sure that my heart was in a posture of being able to serve the future readers of this message. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, wow. I love that. And I will tell you this much for our listeners, um, because I walk so closely with so many content creators and people who are just on the mm-hmm. front lines of doing ministry and, you know, um, passing along God's word and God's truth into people's lives. Y'all, it is no joke. Um, Spiritual warfare is Mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. And I have just seen time and time again, um, as people write messages, speak messages, just the crazy things that will happen in their life. So I want to say to our Mm -hmm. listeners out there, if you are just in it, if you are in ministry, hang on. Mm -hmm. Our God is faithful. He will walk you you through it and um, will carry you to the other side. So hang Mm -hmm. in there. It is worth it. You are doing a good and... um, purposeful battle. Yes. So, yes. Really good. Yes. yes. Well, you guys know that Nikki is an author and obviously that's a lot of hard work, but mm. we also know something else that Nikki does. That's a lot of hard work <laughs> yeah. is she's a farm girl. Yeah, she friends. is. She is a farm girl. And I like to think of myself as a farm girl of some sort too. Grew up with cows. It's great. We talk about this every time yes, you're on the podcast, but but I love to know <laughs> what what is something um, interesting, surprising <sighs> that's happening at the farm today, Nikki? Okay. So let's just say this. You write a book titled Flooded <laughs> oh no! <laughs> you live on a floor. Right? Uh, uh, oh, you guys! It has rained and rained and rained for mm. I feel like months now, and the Fixer Upper Farm is just a big muddy mess. So this past weekend, Chris and I had to build an emergency shelter for our horses. Oh wow! <laughs> because our barn is flooded, they can't get oh, in the barn. Oh my gosh! 
So that happened. And we are also on baby cow watch right now. We Love have um, one of our highlands is due any second now. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if after this recording, I go home and she has already had that baby wow. because I've been watching her nonstop. And mm-hmm. wouldn't that be the moment when I'm not there, she would she would do it. So <laughs> bless, bless. Well, everybody, if you don't know what a highlands cow looks like, do yourself a favor and Google it. Yes. They're the cutest, fluffiest cows out there. Yes. I'm going to stop talking about cows now. Nikki, it is your turn to give your teacher. So just take it away. Thanks, guys. Well, I want to talk to both of you and everyone listening today about this idea of what are some of the questions that we really need to ask when faith feels impossible? And I have three questions because, you know, I've got some Southern Baptist roots in me and I just can't deliver a message without having three points. And so we're going to walk you through just these three questions that I have found helpful in order to sort through some of the own doubt struggles that I've had in my own life. But, you know, as I shared in the very beginning of this podcast, uh, when I started to write the book Flooded, uh, I was immediately hit with what I now consider one of the hardest circumstances that I've ever had to walk through. Uh, Before I sat down to write the book, my mom had a six-month battle with a brain tumor, and it was a very painful process of watching her die this very slow death. And in the midst of that, uh, my brother, my only brother, had tried to commit suicide four different times during that process. So I thought, okay, that was a hard season. This was the hard thing. Uh, but sadly, as soon as I started to pen the words of this book, I will never forget, I was sitting um, on my couch writing one morning, and a doctor from a hospital in Seattle, Washington, called me. And he said, are you the sister of my brother? He said his name. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I'm so sorry to tell you this, uh, but it is, I have your brother here um, on the ICU. He's on full life support. And he took an entire bottle of Tylenol PM and we do not expect him to make it through today. Now, when I was sitting there, I thought, we've been through this four other times with him. He's pulled through every time. I'm just going to pray and I'm going to believe and the Lord is going to be faithful through this because you guys, my brother had such a calling on his life and Mm -hmm. he just had so much potential. And unfortunately, drugs and alcohol addiction addiction and bipolar depression had gotten a hold of his mind and his body and his soul. And so the doctor uh, assured me, he said, I don't even think you're going to make it. Like, even if you tried to get on a flight right now. And I said, oh, I'm going to make it. Mm -hmm. And so I jumped on a plane uh, within three hours, (laughs) was flying to Seattle, had so many people praying and just asking me to like asking the Lord to get me there in time. Because even if my brother was dying, uh, I didn't feel like anyone, no matter what they had done, should die alone. And so I did everything that I could do to get there, and I did. And so when I got there, um, I just started praying, and I just started asking God to come and do something miraculous and to heal him. And I remember at one point, um, he, he, you know, he stayed pretty steady for several hours, and the nurse came in, and uh, this was something kind of funny. I actually sent my husband a picture of wearing a mask. I had to have a mask on, and this was before the pandemic hit. And I was like, mm-hmm. this is so weird to have to wear a mask. <laughs> I had no idea what was coming uh, in the next few months. But she walked in and she said, wow, well, this looks a little bit different. His levels had changed. And I thought, well, okay, maybe he's starting to pull out of this. Well, then just a few hours later, uh, every doctor, every nurse on the, the unit came rushing in. And they looked at me and they said, he's going. He's dying. And I said, okay, okay. Like I, I felt like they were trying to convince me still because I had faith and I believed that God could still step in even at that 11th hour. And so my brother did pass away um, that very cold day. And I was there all by myself um, in a city where I had no friends, no family, no nothing. Uh, and I just remember standing there next to his bed and feeling like this was one of these situations that would forever define my faith. Mm-hmm. And it's normally not what happens in the midst of the situation, but it's what happens after the mm-hmm. situation is over, where we really start to question and wonder if God is really faithful. Yeah. And so these three questions... Uh, that I'm about to walk you through, no matter what your life looks like today, whether you are walking through um, 
a, a family member battling an addiction, you just lost a job, your marriage is crumbling, your kids are making really bad decisions right now, or uh, you are just full of doubt yourself about what God can do in and through you. I want you to know that I really believe that these three questions are going to help you get to a place where you're able to proclaim in your life again, God is faithful no matter what my circumstances say. So the first question that I had to ask myself uh, was this question of what is my why God? Okay. And every single one of us, including you, Meredith, including you, Kaylee, have a why God that we ask. The problem is I don't think we normally spend enough time asking what is our why God. Okay. So we're kind of just going through the motions. We're going through life. We're just trying to get through the next day. And we have all of these feelings of doubt and discouragement, but we don't know where they came from. Mm. And so as you look at your circumstances and you look at the pain, go back to that point. And what is that place where you're asking, why God? Why did you allow this to happen? Why didn't you come through in this way? So I go back to that 11th hour, standing next to my brother's bed, believing that God could step in at that moment and heal him and restore him. That's my moment of my why God, okay? But your why God, there's a why that's in the way of your faith. And if you don't call out that why God, you may never get to the place where you really experience the healing and wholeness that God has from you. See, having questions for God is not the problem. God is not threatened by our why gods, why did you allow this, why is this happening? It's the questioning of God that leads us to a place of disobedience in our own lives. It's that place where our faith really starts to feel what I call fake faith. Mm. But what we have to remember is when we call out our why God, we have to remember that God has a habit of doing holy things in the midst of hard things. Mm. God has a habit of doing holy things in the midst of hard things, okay? So once you call out your why God, the second question that you can ask yourself is, instead of like taking that why God, instead of asking why God, try asking this, what does this mean? God, what does this mean? You know, one of my favorite uh, scriptures is James 1, five, And it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, it will be given to him. And we're gonna talk about this in a second, but this is actually a promise that God has given us as, as people who are committed to the gospel, committed to Jesus Christ, experiencing the Holy Spirit in our lives, that when we have these moments where nothing is making sense, can we just, can we pause there for a second? Because sometimes I think in our faith, when we're walking through really hard circumstances, we try to make sense of God. Mm-hmm. And I get really frustrated when myself and others, we try to explain God away. Like there are some things that will happen on this side of eternity that will never make sense to the human mind. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense to me why God would allow my brother who has three beautiful children who had such an incredible calling on his life to not experience the fullness and healing and the power of Jesus Christ in his life. That doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna sit here today and tell you that I have experienced some kind of like aha light bulb and thing where I just go, it makes perfect sense now. Mm. It's not that way with the situation. And there will be things that you walk through that will never make sense. And so we have to allow ourselves to get to that place where we ask God, what does this mean? Okay, so for me, walking through um, this really hard circumstance with my brother, there are some very meaningful things that God showed me in this, this process. Okay, so number one, guess what? When I got home, I had such an awareness of how incredibly fragile life is. It showed me a compassion and mercy for people who are experiencing mental illness like I've never experienced before. It allowed me to see that just because someone is experiencing something like mental illness, it doesn't mean that that was God's plan for their life. And so I haven't made sense of a lot of that season, but I have found meaning in that season. 
I also was really angry with God that as soon as I would sit down to write this book, he would allow such a painful thing to experience right off the bat. Like, God, could I not just get through at least half the book and then experience that? But now I look back and I'm so grateful because the meaning that came from those words, that pain point inside of me, I was able to step into a place that I was not able to step into with God's wisdom and His mercy in that. Okay, so asking God, what is your why, God? And then changing your why, God, to what does this mean? But then the third thing that I really believe we have to do when we're walking through something that just feels impossible to believe God is we've got to make sure we understand if God's promises that we're claiming for our lives are really for us. And this is not a, an easy conversation to ease into because I want you to know that I recognize when we're walking through things that don't make any sense, sometimes we say things or we tweet things or put things on beautiful graphics because it just sounds really good. Mm -hmm. And so we take God's word and, and we use it in a way that's kind of like a place where we're just trying to soothe our mm -hmm. souls. But here's the thing, all throughout the scriptures, I see that Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. Like he did all these miracles, okay? And so I can look at that. And if I'm trying to put my own circumstance through that lens, it can leave me feeling very frustrated because I can start to wonder, well, why wouldn't God do this for me? And why wouldn't that promise apply to this situation? And so as I've been studying the scriptures in such a deep way, um, specifically the, the biblical account of Noah uh, this past year, which is what the book Flooded is based on, God has really allowed me to see that I was, can I just be honest? I was taking some scripture out of context. Hmm. And I was claiming some promises for my brother, for myself, for my family that were not actually promises from God. And so maybe sometimes we're frustrated with God and we're frustrated with our own process because we have taken a scripture, a promise that maybe wasn't even a promise to begin with, or a promise that was for someone else in the scriptures, and we're trying to claim it for our lives. Mm -hmm. And so uh, here's one of the, the promises that I think sometimes we, we take uh, for granted. Okay, so... Um, in the scriptures, in Genesis chapter 18, we see that uh, there's this biblical account of Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah uh, was given this promise from God that she was going to have this baby, okay? And so it says in verse 13, then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Like she thought this was hysterical that in her old age, she was going to have this baby, okay? And it says, why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Now, sometimes when we read stuff like this, it's really easy to go, well, if God said that to Sarah, then God is saying that to me too. But this was a specific promise that God had given Sarah. It was not a promise that he had given you and I for today. But here's what we could take from that. That question is anything too hard from the Lord. No, mm -hmm. we can take that and we can say that's part of God's character, mm -hmm. but this promise that he would return in about this time next year and she would have a son, that's not something that we can say is anything too hard for the Lord about this time next year, I will have a son mm -hmm. because that's not what that, that scripture means. And that's not a promise um, that God has given. Okay. So here's another one. And this is going to make somebody really mad. <laughs> <laughs> Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is this absolutely true? Yes. <laughs> but if we go back and we study the context of Philippians chapter four, we see that Paul, who's writing this verse, was in a really bad place in his life. He was actually being condemned and shamed because of his belief. Mm -hmm. And so when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, if we were to go back and study that entire passage, uh, what it really means is I can walk through any voice of condemnation, hate towards me because of the gospel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean if I never practice basketball, and I decide that I'm going to enter a three-point contest that I can walk out onto. <laughs> I can walk out onto the My court. My dreams and, are dashed. <laughs> and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and claim that as a promise mm. and, and say that I'm going to make this hoop. Okay? Mm. Like, it's not, it's not how 
this works. And then, you know, another one, and again, this, this was really shocking to me when I found out was um, Matthew 18, 20. So it says, where for two or more are gathered in my, mit, in my name, I am there with them also. And this is true that God is in the midst of corporate worship and when we gather in his presence. But guess what? You don't actually have to be with somebody else to experience God. That's right. Mm-hmm. What this verse means is that it was actually a verse that was um, being used for conflict. Mm. And it was one that was described as God really is for unity. And so God is for us coming together and having hard conversations that bring us together rather than divide us. And so I can't just, you know, walk into a prayer meeting (laughs) and say, you know, where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in my midst. And just believe that in that moment, you know, that that our prayers, because we gather together and, and prayed those things together, that something's gonna immediately change. Mm-hmm. And so taking the time to really understand is is this promise something that that God really gave for me? Now, here's what I wanna say. I am a firm believer that there are times when we are studying the word of God and the Lord will show us something in the scriptures and the Holy Spirit will say, that is for you. Mm -hmm. That is a verse that is for you. I want you to claim that over your life. I want Mm -hmm. you to experience that in um, your relationship with me. And so when I think about the promises that Noah received from the Lord, you know, he was given this really impossible assignment of faith. He was given something that would make no sense to the human mind. In fact, I am 100% confident that somebody in Noah's community looked at him and said, you are absolutely insane that you think that God told you to build an ark, that there's this massive flood coming and that all of humanity is gonna be destroyed. You're crazy. And so there will be times where God says something to us that will not make sense to the rest of the world. And those are, that's what I call like the secret, sacred place where, you know, um, God gives us these assignments of faith to believe and trust that what the Holy Spirit has shown us through the Word of God, that has shown us through our own circumstances, our own places where we're called to believe, um, will be fulfilled. So asking God, what is your why? Like, what is your why, God? What is the why that's in your way? Asking God, what does this mean? Instead of asking him why. And then asking him to show you is the promises that you've been claiming actually a promise for your life? Is there is there something that that maybe you've missed in your studying and your proclaiming and in, in, in your research? Because here's the thing. And this is thing. This is something that I don't think those of us who um, walk with God are willing to admit enough. Can I tell you that there are times that I've been wrong? Mm-hmm. <laughs> there have been times where I just knew that God had mm-hmm. said, "It's time to do this. It's time to do that. Mm-hmm. Here's the process. Here's the way." And I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I I think one of my uh, greatest examples of that that I can give you is this book, Flooded. Mm -hmm. Because six years ago, I just knew that the Lord had told me to write this book on Noah. Now, it wasn't called Flooded and it wasn't, you know, what it is today, but I knew it. And so I went out to all these publishers. This was before Meredith Brock had her brilliance (laughs) in my life. And I, I pitched this idea to everybody. I just knew it was what God had said guess what? They all said, no. They said, no, 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 we don't want this message. And I was so confused. But I laid that message down and I held my hands in a posture of surrender. And now here I am six, seven years later, and I see the fulfillment of that promise that God gave me seven years ago, that there was a message he wanted me to write on. But guess what? I had a lot of things that I had to learn. I had a lot of hard things that I had to walk through. I had a lot of doubts that I personally had to experience to get to this place. So sometimes the promise is not being fulfilled because it's not time. Mm -hmm. But then there's been other times where, you know, I was just so completely off with something the Lord had said. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to be wrong. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, I didn't have this one right Mm -hmm. because God's not having this high standard that he holds in heaven above us of, if you get this wrong, I'm never gonna give you a promise again. (laughs) And if you don't believe and if you don't trust and if you doubt, then this is this is not going to work because mm-hmm. that's not that's not who God is that's not His character, mm-hmm. and so I just want to encourage um, everyone who is listening to this today that no matter what the story of doubt is trying to write in your soul, 
that there is a way, there is a better way than to completely allow doubt to destroy this faith that God is stirring inside of us. You know, the past year and a half has been a really hard year, I would say, for pretty much everyone who is mm-hmm. listening to this. We have all walked through really hard circumstances. But can I tell you that today is a day that I believe that God is asking us to raise up that banner of faith in our lives Mm -hmm. and to declare that despite what any of our circumstances say, despite what any of our doubts are trying to convince us, that God is still faithful and we can stand firm until we see His faithfulness. The last thing that I want to leave with you is this. Uh, There is a prayer that my husband and I have been praying very fervently over the past few months as we've been walking through a really hard assignment of faith. And it's this prayer that is so simple, but it's kept us humble, but it's also kept us in the place of holiness. Mm -hmm. And here's the prayer. God, if we have it wrong, show us the right way. Mm -hmm. There's that place of humility and honor before him. But God, if we have this right, help us to stand firm until we see your faithfulness fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I just encourage you to pray that prayer as many times as you need to today and pray it as often as you need to those days and those moments where doubt starts to try to write a story that is completely opposite of the faithfulness of God. I love that, Nikki. Um, That prayer, I hope somebody out there wrote that down Mm -hmm. because I feel like that is such a good place to land um, with our faith. We're not going to get it right all the time. We're right, really yeah. not. And that's okay. That's what grace is, yes. you know, and what a beautiful thing to be able to grab hold of grace every mm-hmm. day. Um, as you were as you were teaching on your last point about God's promises, our f- grab hold of the ones that are for you, mm-hmm. um, I'm sure that like rattled some of our friends, right? <laughs> like they, they're they about to go take their bumper sticker off of, from Philippians 4.13. You know, they don't know what to do with this. But here I was, I couldn't help but think of this while you were teaching is that each one of those, each one of those stories that you pointed out is evidence that God does speak to us individually. Yes, mm-hmm. yes that's good, Mary. Like it is mm-hmm. evidence that each one of us can hear from God. Mm-hmm. And we don't have to we don't have to wait for the message through someone else. He will speak to you personally. Mm-hmm. Yes. So sit down, get in his word, get quiet, and he will speak to your heart. You don't have to hold on to somebody else's promise. Mm-hmm. He has one specifically for you. So I wanted to encourage our friends with that, but I also wanted to ask you a really hard question. <laughs> oh gosh. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, this is real, like real time. Okay. Okay. Last night, texting with a girlfriend. She's going through some stuff. It's been hard. Mm-hmm. And she texted to me. The exact words were, I know God is good, but he is not good to me. Mm-hmm. And I was wow. like, oh, that's heavy. Mm-hmm. Because that's all, I, I think a lot of people are living there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and wrestling through that moment, sitting next to their brother's hospital bed mm-hmm. and saying, God, I know that you're good. Like I've read your word. And I've even experienced your goodness in my life before. Right. Mm-hmm. But you are not being good to me right now. Mm-hmm. Right. What would you say to our friend who's sitting right there? So in the book, Meredith, I talk about five decisions that we can make when life is hard and doubt is rising. And decision number five is to find the familiar faithfulness of God. Mm. And Noah had walked through a really hard situation of building the ark, then on the ark for over a year. And now he had come off of the ark, okay? And the reality of, man, is God good? Mm. Sure, was wrestling with him in that moment because all of his friends were gone. Mm. All of his family, except those that were with him on the ark, they were gone. I mean, think about it. His neighbor, his coworkers, his grocery clerk, his, you know, bank. I don't know if they had banks back then, but, you know, <laughs> the people that he interacted, they were all gone. Yeah. And so here he had walked through such a season of radical obedience, saying, okay, I know we're going to see God's faithfulness. And then he gets off the, the ark and it's like, Holy smokes, life as I knew it is completely different in that moment. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, you know what Noah did? He immediately built an altar and began to sacrifice and worship God. Wow. And so, in that moment, he had a choice. He could freak out mm. <laughs> and he could completely, you know, go crazy. And we do see him go a little bit crazy in the next few <laughs> verses. Um, but. 
He chose to worship God mm-hmm. in that moment. Mm-hmm. And so for each of us, we have a moment of finding the familiar faithfulness of God. And normally what we need to do is we need to go back to that place where his faithfulness feels familiar. So yeah. for Noah, it was worship. That's where God felt familiar to him. Mm-hmm. God didn't command him to build that mm-hmm. altar and to sacrifice. He just knew that's mm-hmm. what he was supposed to do. And so I would say to your friend that is experiencing that, first of all, totally normal, totally human. Right. Yeah. Noah was human. It was completely human to have thoughts like that. But to go back to that last time where you felt God's faithfulness mm-hmm. and where you experienced and write it down. Like mm-hmm. every, I mean, every day, write down, like I write in my journal, five ways that I saw God move the day before. Mm-hmm. Every mm-hmm. single day, because I struggle with this. Because mm-hmm. it's really easy when our circumstances start stacking and day hard day after hard day after hard day comes. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to see God's faithfulness mm-hmm. in that situation. So we mm-hmm. have to train our brains to go back and find it again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And I would also say, give yourself some time. Mm. Give yourself some time. Mm-hmm. God, again, God is not question. He's not mad at your questions, and it's not our questions that threaten our faith. Mm-hmm. It's the questioning of God that leads us to that place of unbelief. Mm. That is so good, Nikki. I want to say to our listeners today, maybe you're in that spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like maybe you're maybe you're like right now I'm thinking I'm I'm about to order Nikki's book for my girlfriend <laughs> and, uh, for, and send it their way because she needs to hear those five things mm-hmm. you know because I know right now she's she is a hundred percent doubting God yeah. and mm-hmm. saying I don't know that I trust you anymore mm-hmm. and I, I I think I'm out mm-hmm. you know so if you're there friends mm-hmm. if you're there pick up a copy of this book don't let go mm-hmm. don't let go mm-hmm. of the goodness of God because He is there so mm-hmm. Kaylee I think you might have had something that you wanted to interject here. Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, Nikki, I loved the the thought of transitioning your questions from why into what does this mean? Because I think mm-hmm. like whenever you go through hard things, that is building your faith. And right. I think whenever you're asking what, it's a way to build faith. But like you've expressed here, like losing your brother, mm-hmm. losing your mom, that's grief. And, and grief is so often what God uses, yeah, you know, absolutely. to go through that. And so Meredith, remind me what the five stages of grief are. It's like oh, denial and anger. And oh, there's a lot of things that we're going through. But, but back in the day when I actually did <laughs> counseling with my go. master's degree, I could have <laughs> spouted on days spot. off. It's been a hot but, minute. <laughs> but I know, I mean, after going through my own um, grief, and I'm sure everybody is kind of processing this on their own, they're probably wondering, well, what do I do with when, when God does show me what, Mm. you know, you said that you gained an awareness of mental illness Mm. and how, um, it affects more people than you realized. What, like, what did you do with that? Whenever God showed you that this is a what that I want you to pay attention to, or the fragility of life, what do you do with that then in the process of healing? Yeah, Mm. that's a great question. So I think it's when the next hard situation comes our way. Mm-hmm. It's what what did we grow and what did we learn and what did mm-hmm. we gain from that really hard situation? Because that's mm-hmm. what growth is. Yeah, that's right. Like nowhere in the scriptures does it say your growth is going to be easy. Yeah. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> it's going to be hard. And yeah. so you will continue to face mm-hmm. hard situation after hard situation. But so for me with my brother, I mean, I've always had a compassion for people who are mm-hmm. mentally ill. Um, and, you know, my brother was also homeless at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that compassion that I felt from walking through that hard situation. Like after, um, after he died, it was like putting together a puzzle of his life. Mm -hmm. Where were his, where were his things? Where's the last place he was? I mean, I felt like I was a little bit like a detective for a little bit Mm -hmm. um, because I had to find some answers, Mm -hmm. not for anyone, but for me. Yeah. But walking through that allowed me to see like what homeless people who mm. face addiction and mental illness go through. Mm-hmm. So guess yeah. what? You better believe like I'm advocating for that now with yeah. where I can use my voice. Mm-hmm. And so I'm inviting, you know, my readers in that process through the book Flooded, like let's have compassion. Let's have mercy mm-hmm. for people who are experiencing mental illness. Let's not just walk through hard things and go, oh, that was just really hard. Let's mm-hmm. let it, let us change us so that the next time the hard thing comes mm-hmm. or someone else walks. Can I tell you, after my mom died, it was like all of a sudden I had all of these friends who were losing their moms. Mm. And now like just the other day, a friend invited me to go to lunch with her and she's older than me. She's all, I would consider her wiser than me, but she looked at me and she goes, the Lord told me, um, my mom's dying and I knew I needed to come talk to you. And I was like, oh my gosh, not me, (laughs) you know, but that's what Mm -hmm. God will do when you allow him to use your hard situations Mm -hmm. for his glory 
eventually. Now we got to go through some healing on our mm-hmm. own first um, yeah. before we help other people. Um, and you need to give yourself time and permission to do that as long as possible. Mm. But I think the the best thing that can come from the hard things is when God starts to use it for His good. Mm-hmm.